Okay, so we're here at Kevin Coyd for our Kevin Coyd day, and we're going to take you on a tour of the um, of the space. Um, and it's a really interesting site, really, because it tells us about the kind of changing perceptions of um, mental health and medical geographies, as well as the kind of material culture of, of the landscape, really, and the architecture uh, of the time. So as we're going around the site then, we'd like you to think about um, three themes in particular. So firstly, medical and mental health geographies. So what sort of contraptions, ways of life, rules, discourses, languages, policies and medical practices can we determine were in evidence at the site? Secondly, we'd like you to look at landscapes of memory and material culture. So how does the material culture of the space take on a life of its own? Um, so the material objects have both a kind of brute materiality, but also carry the ideologies of those that shape them. But of course, objects aren't straightforward, but actually have an uncanny knack of taking on their own agency and subverting the meanings that were initially attributed to them. So what kind of architecture is present at the site? What has happened to it over time? How do the objects and architecture speak to you uh, around the site? And in what ways is it a kind of landscape of power? And finally, we'd like you to think about representations at Kevin Coyd. So these kinds of places can be multivocal and, and be represented differently by different social groups for different reasons. So what kinds of oral histories, memories, archives and writings can we uncover from former residents, medical personnel and workers from the site? What imagery still exists of the site? How has Kevin Coyd been represented through museum exhibitions, archives and academic writing? And why might there be conflicting accounts? We will be talking about um, mental health uh, and medical geography. So if you do feel that you are affected by any of the topics, you are welcome to choose a, a different day. And just to let you know as well, of course, that you can touch base with your tutors or with Rosemary Muxworthy if you want to discuss anything that we've uh, talked about today. So we're in Kevin Coyd Hospital today and we're going to do a walking tour. I'm going to show you some of the rooms and some of the things. I'm going to tell you some of the history about it. Um, I'm on with my book by T.G. Davis, who wrote a book in the 80s about the history of it. Um, and all I'm going to do is I'll mention some details as we go through. This is the staircase, one of the only staircases up to like a doctor's quarters. And we're going to see that to begin with. But this was actually built in 1932. But it was designed much earlier than that by uh, 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 George Hind. And he, built the, he designed the building in about 1904, 1905. And then about 1911, the plans were published. Um, in 1917, um, to uh, Evans Thomas got the contract to build the foundations. And at that time, they built the foundations. They started, but then they stopped building, partly because of World War I, uh, but also because, the, in the, because of the, the, the Asylums Act, they'd actually had 20,000 bed spaces in hospitals across the UK. So they were actually too many beds, not enough patients, all the other way around. So what they did is they halted building until 1927. They came back to the site uh, and then they started building. And by 1932 then they had building what Daily Express called uh, the most uh, modern hospital in the world at the time. Um, and we're now here in 2021 uh, and it's completely the other end of the scale now. We've now decommissioned the building completely. Um, we still actually have one ward in one of the old parts. This the, so there is some patients in one of the old parts, but it's been completely changed and upgraded. And this whole hospital now is empty. So um, George Hind was the architect of Lunacy. Um, his father was actually designed and built as an architect prisons. Uh, when George Hind got that contract, I think he built 13 hospitals just like Kevin Coyd across the UK. Some of them have exactly the same tower. They look almost identical. And the plan for an asylum at that stage was, uh, was had to have unobstructed views to the south. It had to be isolated, and it also had to have its own supply. Had, most of them had farms, and they had recreational things. But when the building was built, because of all the delays, it was built to the original plans from 1911, which is stamped on the plans, in 1932. And it was built in those interwar years, so the quality of the build is very good. It's a very high quality building, but it's still built that Victorian asylum style, that standard. There's lots of things to see. Um, I haven't been here for two years, so I'm hoping things may have changed. I know there's a lot of bacteria and stuff in here growing on the carpets and, uh, and the walls are black and things are falling off. So I'm quite interested to see all that. So let's go upstairs. 
when I, when I was working here, this had a snoop pool table in here. This was the doctor's mess, really. They'd sit out and hang out in here. Um, before that, it was actually the hospital library for a period of time. But in the back room here, there's a bedroom and a toilet, and there was a phone by the toilet, so you could call the on-call doctor to, to race out an emergency if a patient was off baseline. And then if you go now over the new build, there's still quarters over there. So it wasn't recent, it was only the last three or four years they've moved that, this out. Because this end block was one of the last bits we kept using until the hospital was finished. So, um, yeah, this is, again, I think in the, in the beginning of the hospital, when it opened originally, this would have been for that reason. This would be consultants' offices and a doctor's mess even then, right at the outset. This is one of the pianos, and a lot of these, every ward had a piano. All the wards were supposed to have um, things to engage the patients. Later on, they had you know, music and uh, record players and things. And I still have some of the original, um, oh, the big 78 records uh, that were played here, so classical music um, all the way through. But the pianos, there was one every ward. Now this is the last two, the left here. One of the nurses is going to collect this, um, but Stevie left here. He's a tune, but um, that's why it's here. We're going to the big hall as well, because in the hall they used to have a piano in there, um, and one of these may have been using that later on, I suppose. So it's quite dark in here because also, we've boarded all the windows up, and we've done that to keep out the urban explorers. Um, we did do some guided tours, which was great, so a lot of, some of the urban explorers came here then. Um, but because we had to now board the windows up and they put steel plating outside, we're going to have to use a torch to, to look around. Um, so we'll do, we'll do that. We'll also mind our steps as we walk through, because there's pools of water, and I think the floor is breaking up in some areas too. So this is one of my favourite rooms, because it's got these lovely um, brick tiles, or these um, fired bricks with this glaze on them. Um, a lot of the hospitals that George Hind did, were, all the corridors are like that. They saved money in the 1930s, they didn't do it here. So our corridors have just got brick. But this is actually a butchery. So um, they had a farm, they had animals, they used to have their own meat. And if you look here, these are the butcher's hooks. So this is where the meat would have hung uh, in this room. And you can see they haven't been moved there, original from the 1930s. There's a fridge, other things have been added since, or at least in other rooms they've all been added. So there are a lot of changes, but this room is pretty original, um, considering all the changes. But if you look at the window here, you can see all these lovely bricks and the way they've uh, gone over. And these things just last forever. You know, it's incredible building style, I think. In the, full, the swing of the hospital, when it was full, it was full of patients, uh, it was a massive kitchen, which would turn over, obviously, breakfast, dinner, and tea every day. Um, they'd take um, cake and coffee to the consultants at, um, at 10 o'clock, uh, very regimented meal times. Um, and that would all happen in the, in the big hall and some of it out into the wards. Um, and at that time, the staff would have weddings here in the chapel, and they'd cater the whole wedding, um, and they'd be able to do that. But back in the original 1930s, when they had a farm, I know that all the, all the vegetables would arrive en masse, all the food would arrive en masse, it was stored here and prepared here, but they cooked from scratch. Um, and it wasn't until the 90s, really, they started doing the, the cooked freeze and all the rest of it, and having freezers in here. But before that, it was all cooked from scratch every single day. So in the kitchens, obviously, when, in, in fact, patient number one, uh, John Clark, I think he's down on his record as actually working in the kitchens in the mornings and helping out in the kitchens. And that was the way for the hospital. A lot of patients were used on the, on the, on the front entrance and portering and taking things up. And they actually, one of the porters was trained by a patient to do the mail run and things like that and then stand right in the beginning. Um, and one of the patients, and I don't remember the full story, did come into the kitchens and steal a ham at one point. Um, so, but it was, you know, it was a very uh, understood, you know, everybody knew the patients and how to deal with them. Um, funnily enough, I remember a story when I was working here, my manager was coming in through the front entrance and one of the patients was there and she had a stick, she was partially sighted. Um, and she was in a beat Melanie with a stick. And, um, and it's, I, I didn't know how to manage it at the time, but a nurse walked past and said, you don't want to beat Melanie with a stick. And then and just, and just casually walked past and carried on walking and the patient just reduced, you know, and brought the level down. It's incredible really that what the nurses do to, to manage those patients. But in the kitchens, I understand, they, they played quite a full part working in, amongst the staff. So those are the freezers there. Freezer. And this would have been where all the griddles were, all the ovens. So, um, Katrina Madrill, who's one of the cooks here, gave us a walking tour and she explained quite a few things about this room. One of them was that in actually fact, in the whole of the hospital there's a massive basement complex that follows every corridor. All the asylums have them and they're heating ducts. Um, at one time there was a leak in the basement, I understand that it flooded. And at that point, all the water started building up. But Katrina said, we were all in the, um, 
um, we were all in the kitchen and all of a sudden, bang, cockroaches started coming up through all the vents. And any cockroaches, any insect was there, all these cockroaches flooded the kitchen, they had to close the kitchens that day because the basement flooded. And I think only recently the basement flooded again and there was a torrent of water in there, but uh, I know we have our estates guys to come in and sort those things out, but it's quite a big basement down there. We may get a peek if we get a chance, we find a way in there. But there's a bit of asbestos, so we have to be careful. So this is the William Owen Hall, um, named after William Owen. He's the alderman in Swansea Council who really pushed the build of Kevin Coyne Hospital. When it had that sort of hiatus, when it stopped, he, William Owen was the guy who really brought it to life, that campaign to have it built. Um, and this was named after him. So William Owen Hall, this was the main hall. This was a stage. So behind here, we'll have a peek through in a minute. There is a stage and that's the top of the stage. You can imagine that's where people have sat stood and this is the this was a huge hall all in one open area then we had loads of acts playing here for patients it was quite a sort of a, a list of people including things like max boyce but also um brotherhood of man played on this just after they won the european song contest um and we also had a film projector right at the back which would send the screen all the way to this part here um and when they did that they had the i think one of the portrait guys no sorry Something from the States told me that they had the premiere of Live and Let Die here before it was in Swansea Cinema. Apparently it was packed with staff that night, as well as all the patients. But if you look through here, you can see the bigger part of the hall. It's really dangerous. I'm not supposed to go in here because it's collapsing. So I'll show you that, that basically this floor is going through. Now, this was the original floor, but what happened was there was a heating system that George Hind had put in here, or at least 1930s, they put a, a steam-generated heater in there. And, and the old uh, estates guy, Bob Muxworthy, he said, whatever you do, don't turn that off. Um, and the second Bob retired, they turned that off, and then the floor rotted and it fell through. Um, that's the story Bob gives me anyway. Uh, <laughs> so this is the door, this is an original door, this is a bricked up door. This is where the original stage is, and you can look behind me in a minute, you'll see the stage and all the lighting gantry and everything for a proper stage. Down the basement below us, we might get a chance to see them, there's huge slabs of slate, and they were to draw the curtains back. When you pull the curtains, I understand these huge slabs would slide down. Um, but you can still see the paint on the back of the wall where they did plays. All the staff put on plays every year. I think it always, always did a pantomime. Um, and this, this hall was used for so many other things. Every year, there was the Kevin Coyd Fair, wasn't it? I think every year, and they'd hold it on the field. If it was raining, they'd hold it in here instead. So they hold lots of jumble scissors and things. So I'm going to go down here and I'm going to appear at the back somewhere. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think you should come down the steps. You can look through if you want. Okay, there's quite a few dead pigeons here. In the corner here, there's a lighting system, and that light is loads and loads of little slots there that control all the lighting for the stage. It was a really advanced lighting system. You can see here above me, there's all the gantry for all the lights, and still some bulbs up there I can see in a few units. And there's a tiny little set of steps at the back there, and they go all the way up, and they go across a little gantry, and then they go into the attic space above this hall. And apparently, occasionally, the estates guys used to have to go in there and crawl all the way along to fix the lighting systems. Quite, quite dangerous. So there's a gantry up there. I, I haven't stood on there. It doesn't look very safe, but the ladder looks even worse. In here also is lots of other junk I can see. So we've got, let's look here. We got, there's an old telephone here, um, but also I can see Swansea District Association for Mental Health um, documents and things here. There's some other stuff and a sewing machine and filing cabinets. And generally they just use it as a, once it was closed off, they stopped using it as a stage. They then turned it into sort of a, this is for storing, really, and junk. Okay, so during this process of collecting the history of the break, we've spoken to a lot of oral histories, and one chap I spoke to was Cl uh, Clive Pryor, and he said that what they used to do is play pool under the stage. And there's a big pool table here under the stage, and they used to play it. And the noise of the pool used to, to rattle a patient, or at least a person, who apparently lived in the basements. So this is in about the 1970s. And there's the basement door. You can see it just behind me. And apparently, when they used to make noise, he used to creep up slowly and he used to come and sit on the steps and they used to give him food. Apparently, he was tolerated. The staff knew, the hospital managers knew he was living down there. 
but nobody thought to go and stop him. And I apparently lived down there for some time. Uh, yeah, it's an amazing thing to live, think about that. The basement's are not a very nice place to be. There's lots of pipes and dust and things like that. And there are windows up into the courtyards. But um, yeah, the hospital management just let it, let it happen. I've just realised that the slate I was talking about earlier, um, Brian's just pointed out, this isn't for the curtains, actually. This is the, this is the pool table. So when Clive Pryor was talking about his pool table, this is the part, this is, this is actually it, what's left of it. And this is one of the longest corridors in the hospital, and you can see it runs all the way to the far end, that end, and far end this way. And you can see the colour tiles on the floor. So here I've got green and grey tiles. So this was signifying this is the female side of the hospital. And over there you've got the black and white tiles, that's the male side of the hospital. And when you look at the design of the building and you look down, you can see that on the male side you've got the estates yard and some of the patients used to help out in the estates yard. And the laundry was in the female side and the patients used to help out on that side. There's also an upholstery room and all sorts of other workshops. They used to do lots and lots of other things. But there is the divide. So here would have been a door. So essentially it was run as two completely separate hospitals at one point. So you had all the male patients and female patients didn't mix at all. The only time they'd ever socialised together was uh, under supervision when they'd be in the hall if there was a show or something on and they'd sit separate sides. And it wasn't until much, much later on that we had sort of um, mixed gender wards and things changed in that respect. So of course th there was a point where patients were giving, uh, were actually allowed to have their own money and manage their own fin finance, which was very really good for them. And this is where they queue up to get the money. Uh, and there'd be a huge queue of them down here. Uh, I know the other currency in Kevin Coyle was cigarettes. Um, you always, a lot of the staff used to keep a cigarette in their pocket because it would always calm patient down because there's a lot of smoking in this building. And we'll see, if we see one of the smoking rooms in one of the wards, they're quite interesting because they're just like brown, uh, yellow rooms there. But this is where they used to get their money and they used to go to the shop. So we had a patient shop here, we had hairdressers here. Um, you know, it was like a proper community. And these, these corridors were full of people. And in, the, in the early days, it was busy. You know, you'd see people and you'd recognise all the patients, you'd say hello to them. Um, and staff were, th you know, and it was, people would, you know, bring people, family members with them where they came in, particularly in the fate days when they had kids would come in here. It was a real community, you know, it wasn't like a, an isolation room. So this is x-ray. Now, in Kevin Coy's, funny enough, my background, I'm a radiographer, I'm an ex a radiographer. This, so this is the kind of kit I was trained on. And, um, they generally do sort of basic chest x-rays, that kind of thing, but even by the time of the 1980s, they'd already stopped using this facility for x-rays. I don't think there were many x-rays were ever taken here. If they had particularly a broken bone, that sort of thing, they'd always go to another site anyway. So they do for sort of basic x-rays, not, nothing particularly. But in here you have the old, um, funny enough, in the collection we've got all the old x-ray tubes for this unit. But it was decommissioned, and then in behind us here, if we go through, if I show my torch, if you follow me and you'll see, this is the dark room. So they used to process their own films properly in a dark room. Can you squeeze through? So in here, now this is very familiar to me because this is a proper old dark room. But here we've got the old tanks. So in here all the silver bromide tanks would have had developer fix and all the rest of it. And you'd done all this in under a red light. And then you'd pass them through this little safe here. So once the film comes in, you bring it through the here, then you open and expose it. You transfer it through the different things, get your film, put it on the light box, which obviously doesn't work now. And then uh, you have your film, then you can turn the lights on, off you go. And that's how they do the transfer of the x-rays. It's amazing, all this stuff. And it's still got a splicer. That's nice, the name, the name on it. It's really cool to see all this stuff still here. I thought they'd have taken it out. In fact, all the floor, I can see those glittery things. That's the silver bromide that's clearly linked out of the tank. So that's silver on the floor there. Um, in fact, there's a crust at the bottom of that. You know, if I pull that crust down, put a, put a, put a um, under a blowtorch, you'd have 99% solid silver. At this point in the video, we're going to step away from the tour for a moment to talk about Kef and Coyd's corridors. The hospital corridors are long and straight and they have a very imposing look to them. They become a point of study and a point of note for everybody who comes into this space. In fact, Hein 
when he designed his county asylums, probably wasn't actually thinking about the imposing nature of these corridors at all. Asylum design was a huge source of debate and thought in the Victorian era. How do we create hospitals that promote healing, but also keep patients safe? How do we stay away from the community because there is huge fear and stigma associated with these hospitals? We have to remember, at the time this hospital was built, we did not even refer to mental health illnesses. They were known as lunacy. Hines' official government title was the architect for lunacy. Hines Kefenkoid Hospital was built on what became known as a broad arrowhead design. From the sky, the building is actually triangular in its layout. And to understand Kefenkoid's corridors, we need to understand what Hein, as its architect, was trying to do when he designed the hospital. He was endeavouring to make it as fast as possible for staff to get from one side of the hospital to the other, whilst ensuring that all his wards were south-facing with their big open windows and access to the patient pavilions in the garden. He was also making sure that both the male and the female sides had easy and speedy access to the central hall. By default, that means a long, large central corridor connecting the two diagonal ward wings. But regardless of why these corridors exist, of all the images that we associate with mental hospitals from the Victorian asylum era, the corridor has become one of the most archetypal. It appears in horror films, it's often shot in ghostly black and white photographs populating the pages of history books. It's captured in a state of dereliction when urban explorers photograph disused asylums. And indeed, every single person who we brought on walking tours around Kef and Coyd as part of a heritage project would stop to photograph the corridors. Maybe it's because the asylum corridor became to symbolise the endlessness of life in these hospitals. The monotony of the routine of being ill for a very long time in an institution and people's fear about what was happening behind the closed doors of institutions which for decades and in fact centuries represented the primary form of care for the mentally ill. Incarceration is also a hugely important concept in thinking about asylum spaces. Large sets of iron keys often appear in museum collections, representing the idea of locked down places. Stories of escape and recapture, of uniforms that made patients appear like convicts, conjure up an idea of asylums as authoritarian and actually prison-like. But like many myths that are based on our fear, these concepts are only partial truths and the reality of hospital life is far more nuanced and complex. The story of Kef and Coyd's gates and railings is an example of one of these complicating realities. When Kevin Coyd was first built, large iron gates were erected at the front and they were kept locked for most of the time, giving a sense of a closed institution. But during World War II, not only the gates, but also the iron railings around the building mysteriously disappeared. Their removal went unchallenged because it was common at that time to melt down valuable metal assets for the war effort. But years later, it was revealed that actually, the gates were not removed for war manufacturing, but because the hospital manager at the time realized it was a convenient excuse to remove what he and his staff saw as an unnecessary obstacle to free passage in and out of the hospital. 
Rather than a closed and isolated system, Kevin Coyd was an institution and it was embedded in the community. The gates were seen by staff as an unhelpful hindrance. At this point, we're going to rejoin the tour and go into one of Kef and Coyd's wards to learn more about life in the hospital. So you just come upstairs to the ward. One of the problems with Kevin Coy, that all, of course they're mostly ambulant patients, but the stairs have caused problems over the years, getting equipment and things up. But we've now just entered the ward. So in this ward, you have the assessment unit where the patients come in and are assessed by the nursing staff before they go into the ward. Um, there's a sister's office there, and then we have like a kitchen, and then we'll go through the coffee lounge where patients used to spend their day. This is one of the day rooms. So this is where the patients would have spent a lot of their hours and they sort of had seating in here, all that kind of thing and there would have been sort of one-to-one -one nurses for some patients, depending on them. But the view, unfortunately today, it's completely pea soup out there, but normally you can see the whole of Swansea Bay and the Mumbles Pier. Um, and then when you're in the hospital on that side, you can see the Gara, and when the sun sets, it sets across and looks over on this building, because we're right on the top of the hill, remember? So you get some fantastic views in, in almost every direction. All of Hines asylums were south-facing, um, and he was really interested in having well-being for the patients, being able to go outside, he also built pavilions in the gardens. So out here, in the, on the south side, there would have been pavilions outside each ward. Everyone had their own fences, so each patient area could go to their own pavilion outside, and they'd be able to walk in the gardens. But it was, had to be on the south side of the building. The church is all, and all his asylums is always on the north side. Uh, I think the farm is over that side as well, in this one particular case. So this is where, this is where the patients would come to, to collect their medication in the morning uh, or the daytime, whenever they have the medication. Uh, up until very recently, there was a couple of bottles of vodka and some whiskey bottles in the back there. So patients would often go out to the community, they'd buy something like that, come back, and then they'd have it taken off them. And it'd be stored in the back. It's probably gone now. Has it gone right? Probably has. But this is where they'd stand and give their, their pills out quite formally, if you like. Uh, and one of the nurses would have drawn them up in here. And um, there would have been a dress cabinet on the walls, metal lockaway cabinets, and the nurses all had bunches of keys. One of the things about asylums is you have to lock doors and all the rest of it, but then you get that horrible sound of keys rattling on staff all the time, uh, which I always thought was a real negative. Um, digital locks, that's what we need in these days, isn't it? So. Okay, so this is a patient's art room, as I remember. So there had been, I remember coming in here, talking to one of the OTs, and there was an OT room in here, and they were just doing arts and crafts and things like that. One of the OTs, actually, Robbie Thomas, told me a great story. She was saying, when you're trying to engage with patients on a ward, particularly of mixed abilities, she said, the best thing to do is to do nothing. And I'd set my art materials up on the table, and I'd start making something, sticking things down. A patient would come up and see what I'm doing, and I'd pass it to him, and he'd start doing that. And I'd start another one, and then another patient would turn up. And before you know it, you've got a table full of patients all doing the artwork. She said it was all a fantastic way to do it. In here, it works with children as well, actually. I've done that with my kids. You can see... There's paint peeling off the walls. This is the bathroom area, so this would have been, a, in the back there, there'd been a bath and a toilet and a shower, a cubicle on that side. But you can see the paint's all peeling off. I don't know why we've got this here, because there could be some asbestos, so we obviously won't go that way. We're going to see, so now, as we're going on now, going to the bedroom areas. So some patients had single rooms, and some, pa uh, some patients had wards. Even they had some lighting gear until quite recently here. Um, this room is very interesting, though. So if you can come in this way, I'll show you. You can see this door is yellow, and there's some yellow staining on the floor. This was the smoking room in the, in the days that I remember it. So patients would come in here and smoke. But if you also notice, there's a baffle on the wall here, on this side and the other side. The door frame is deeper, and this was originally designed as one of the padded cells. We never had cells here, apparently. We never had the padded cells fitted, or at least they were never used if they were. But this baffle was here, designed in all these asylums, so that the patient couldn't rush somebody coming in the door. Um, this door would have had a, a window, and there'd have been a double door. According to Tom Ford, one of our experts, there's a door on the inside and an outside door, so staff could open the first door to look in. Also, this window is also altered. I understand that that would be much higher up, so the access to the patient wouldn't have been so easy. And the patient would have been locked in here, obviously, if they were off baseline or they had uh, a particular environment outbursts. So, um, yeah, these are patients' rooms. So some of these rooms are single rooms. Um, some of them were doubles, and some of them had three or four patients in them, like a little micro ward. So 
And I did an oral history down in West Wales recently with, a, with an old lady who'd worked here in the 1940s. And she was saying that when she used to work in those wards, they used to line all the wheels up, but the floors were so clean, you could see the wheels of the beds there and also reflected in the floor. Because, um, of course, they were polished oak floors at that point. So there was pillars, big pillars in the middle. So when we see the pillars later on, I'll tap them. You'll know that's where all the beds were, head to head, all the way down the middle. Yeah, of course, this has changed quite a bit. So um, these have been, the windows have fallen out. So at some point in the 1980s, they had, um, 1990s, they changed the windows. All the original wood and sash windows, which were fantastic, that have been here since the beginning, 1932, 80 years have been maintained and some of them were great, but up here they changed it to UPVC and I think even within the first couple of years the seals started going um, and the, the, it's just not as good a system as good old wooden glass, unfortunately. You can see all this. Uh... And I want to look at this bacteria here, right? And I'm interested in this from a biological point of view that there's more bacteria here and it's probably because of the little hands touching it and yeah, things, yeah. which is why it's with that lovely bloom of So all these have got these little uh, access windows. So you turn a key in here and it'll make the glass go uh, uh, transparent. Yeah, so this is obviously one of the old bathrooms. Um, and this is obviously a male ward because it's all blue. Um, and they'd had, obviously staff used to try to super, supervise when they needed to, patients. Obviously this was probably put up before even closed because they're always going to put some shelves there or something. But um, it's funny, there's a lot of, discussion about bathing and institutional bathing in the literature on asylums and it's interesting to talk about that. I understand here they had a lot of institutional things like tea, making tea and, and, and the way they, they, they did these things but in the 80s and 90s those things were changing and it's down to some of the nursing staff were making those changes. One chap um, uh, who did an oral history, Peter, I'll come back to me, he was telling a story that he refused to make cups of tea in one huge tea urn with milk and sugar already added. He, he started, when he started here as a junior member of staff, he started making individual cups of tea for the patients. The ward manager said, what are you doing? You've not got time to do that. Give them all tea with two sugars. Uh, and he point blank refused. He said, no, no, I'm going to do this professionally. I'm a nurse, I want to change this practice. This is awful. You know, this person might want sugar. And he changed that practice. And that, from that point forward, in all the wards started to change. And he, he brought that practice in. So nursing staff, not just the consultants, are very instrumental in changing the way mental health is, uh, uh, yeah, changing mental health forever. I can't remember the name of the company now, but originally there were keys made for the hospital and they were all, the, they had one master key that would unlock all the locks in the whole hospital. Um, and there's a nice big old fat key. No. And there was one key for the male side, one key for the female side. And then all the individual locks within those locked areas had their own keys. So if you're a staff member, you could only unlock all the wards in your area. But there was one person, there was a mask key that would come in and lock all the locks in the hospital. Um, and then over time, they changed them to other locks. And then chaos reigned because they had tins of keys in this building. Once they got rid of that lock system, it was a disaster because then... Every ward had hundreds of keys and they'd lost the keys and it was just crazy, crazy. Just down the corner here is the um, electroconvulsive therapy unit where they, used to, where they delivered um, ECT. And you can here see the, the, there's the power unit connection to that. Um, not as barbaric as it sounds. It's a very effective therapy. We still use it today. Um, and patients who are either very low or very high, uh, when, they, when they deliver it, I know it can, can, can completely correct them. For, that, for a period of time. So they come back every six months. And some of the patients I've seen come back and forth here, and you know, I've seen them and I understand that it's very effective for them. And you know, some people with their clinical depression um, can actually close down to the point and it actually kills them. So it can be a very effective therapy for those patients. And I think of all the details, I'm not a mental health nurse, but I'm pretty sure that's correct. But that's the power in there, it's just interesting. We can see the unit, but there's everything been taken out now, so there's just an empty room. <laughs>